Hi friends, how are you? And welcome to... Crimes with Cole. So before we get into today's video, I wanted to thank you guys for taking the chance, clicking on my video, and hearing what I have to say. I appreciate it more than you will know. So thank you. In today's video, we will be talking about another ruthless, heartless woman who had everyone fooled, but the detectives just couldn't accept the facts presented in the case. And they kept digging and digging. And wouldn't you know it, they discovered the real truth behind it all. This is the case of Stacy Castor. Stacy Castor was born as Stacy Ruth Daniels to her mother and father, Jerry and Judy, on June 24th, 1967. When she was just 17 in 1985, she met the man she would fall deeply in love with named Michael Wallace. The two married on April 7th of 1990 and would end up having their first daughter, Ashley, in 1988 and their second daughter, Bree, in 1991. Michael was said to be a great, fun guy. The life of the party and always willing to help you. If you had something Michael could help you with, he was there willing to help. He was just that type of guy. The type that would take off, take their shirt off their own back for you type of guy. As the family of four started in their journey of life, the couple themselves were starting to grow apart. It was rumored that affairs were happening on both behalves. Their different work schedules didn't help the situation either. Now, Stacy would later claim in life that Michael had a drug and drinking problem that he kept hidden, but they always made sure that those two little girls were always loved and taken care of. Except Stacy noticed that Michael always seemed to show favors to the youngest, Brie. Stacy took it upon herself to start gravitating towards their oldest, Ashley, later becoming her best friend in life. In late 1999, Michael had fallen ill and it was very noticeable to loved ones around him. He was always coughing, physically seemed like puffy and swollen all the time and was very unsteady on his feet. Stacy claims she was considering divorce during the holidays while he was ill from just how the relationship had changed over the years and how much his illness had taken a toll on their already weak relationship. And with the holidays quickly approaching, all of his family and extended family encouraged him to go get medical attention. He did, however, seek medical attention from his family doctor who said he may have an inner ear disorder. After the new year, Michael was unable to seek more medical attention. Family so deeply wanted him to get because he had ended up passing away on January 11th, 2000. On that chilling day, Ashley, their oldest, was only 12 and left with her dad alone just hanging out at the house. She said she noticed his sickly body, how much the illness had changed him, and that he wasn't the same dad she remembered from years ago. She didn't think too much of it. I mean, she figured he was just having one of his bad days and left it at that. It wasn't until she discovered that he had passed away that really made her reflect on just how different he looked that day. Michael was found unresponsive on the sofa in the living room. When the doctors 
had looked over Michael, they determined he had died from a heart attack. And Stacy, the grief-stricken widow, just accepted it and did not push any further. She didn't question the doctors on his strange illness that no one seemed to be able to diagnose. Did not question what caused the illness. She didn't question anything. She just simply accepted the answer that Michael had died from a heart attack. He was 38 years old and healthy before this illness took over. Michael's sister, however, did not accept the fact that he passed away from a heart attack. And she kept pushing and pushing to have an autopsy done. But Stacy simply did not want that for Michael and was fine with the answers she had been given. Stacy collected the $55,000 life insurance money and her heart would soon find comfort in a new man's arms just a few years later. In 2001, Stacy was introduced to a man named David Castor from her boss. David owned a air conditioning installation and repair company. He was a very outdoorsy type of man. He had a boat, he had four wheelers, snowmobiles, you know, he was very hard working. He was work driven. He just, he worked hard for what he wanted and he enjoyed life. David had a grown son named David Jr. from a previous marriage. And on August 16th, 2003, Stacy became the new Mrs. Castor. Mm. Her two daughters, Ashley and Brie, now 13 and 10, were not fond of this new marriage. David had expectations that what he said went in the house and shouldn't be questioned. And the girls naturally just questioned everything. That's just kind of who they were. Uh, and so, you know, when David asked or said something, they just naturally were like, mm. Not to mention the fact that they're 10 and 13. And they also didn't want their dad being replaced. And while everyone heals differently after the death of a spouse, obviously in this case, Stacy didn't take too long as some may need. I think a lot of times it takes children longer I think even with divorce, it's just hard for children to really accept some things. And I think that a lot of times that's why children start rebelling and they don't care for their step parent because they don't want anyone to get the notion that they want to replace a parent. You know, they don't want this new life their parent or parents have accepted they want what they are used to you know it's just it's a rough transition on everyone because the children's tension I feel start rubbing off on this new marriage or relationship and it just causes friction between everybody and the household in my opinion but in this situation the friction didn't last too long because on August 22nd 2005 David was found dead in his bedroom. Stacy had rang 911 on Monday morning and claimed that the last time she spoke to her husband was at 5 a.m. on that previous Sunday, so the day before. She said that David was just angry and grabbed a bottle of Southern Comfort and then locked himself in the bedroom. She said she went to check on him hours later and when she put her ear up to the door, she could hear him sleeping. You know, those, you know. So she just assumed that he was, you know, sleeping off his drinking filled rage. Back to Monday morning, Stacy rang 911 because David did not show up to work. So police went to do a welfare check they made their way to the bedroom and kicked in the locked 
bedroom door to find David's unresponsive, lifeless body on the bedroom floor. Two full glasses were sitting on the nightstand next to the bed. One glass contained a green liquid, which was later identified as antifreeze, and the second glass contained the Southern Comfort, um, you know, he took with him into the bedroom. They also found a bottle of antifreeze laying partially under the bed with its top off. Now turning into a full investigation to find out what happened, the police start searching the home. When they discovered a turkey baser with what seemed to be alcohol in it, they grew very suspicious as to why it had liquor in it. Who puts liquor in a turkey baser? They spoke with Stacy. She had informed them that David had just recently lost his father and it threw him into a depression. You know, he must have drank himself to death because he was so depressed, she claimed. But everyone who knew David for a long time, including his ex-wife, uh, shot this theory down because anyone who knew David just knew he wouldn't commit, you know, he wouldn't take his own life. That just wasn't David. And with all the signs pointing to David taking his own life, you know, the coroner ruled it as that. He ruled it as David took his own life. Now, Detective Dominic Spinelli refused to accept this answer. Something did not add up. The turkey baster he had found had antifreeze in it, not alcohol. And it also contained David's DNA on the tip alongside Stacy's fingerprints on like the base part. But, you know, that's a common cooking tool for some. You know, both of them did live in the house. Although suspicious, that wasn't enough evidence. Detective Spinelli started digging and discovered that in David's will, he left everything to his wife and her two daughters but nothing to his own son. And there was no falling out between him and his son that would result in him being kicked out of the will. So that was another red flag. Now, once Detective Spinelli discovered Stacy's previous husband, Michael, had died, he made some phone calls and discovered that Stacy's first husband, Michael's death, had some similarities to David's death. Remember that she claimed Michael had all these medical issues and she was contemplating on divorcing him because he was just so sick and it was taking a toll on their relationship, on the family. You know, no one knew what was wrong or how to fix it. But Detective Spinelli discovered that the worst thing that had ever happened to Michael medically was a hernia, which is by far not as bad as some medical conditions that others have to endure in their life. Now Spinelli knew, he just knew David was poisoned with antifreeze. And antifreeze will leave crystals in your organs, even post-mortem. Antifreeze, if consumed in significant amount, can kill someone within 24 to 72 hours. It shuts down your kidneys, and it can cause other organs to start shutting down too. It is said that one third of a cup is a lethal dose. One third of a cup. That's like almost three fluid ounces. Like how much a baby would drink at a month or two old. It's not a lot. So imagine consuming it in small amounts here and there and because it's odorless and it's like sweet tasting, then you start getting dizzy all the time and headaches that just don't go away and nauseous, your body starts hurting, you mentally are just all over the place. It would probably be a painful way to go and make you crazy along the way. Detective Spinelli's decision made he decides to exhume the body of Michael to see if he has antifreeze in his system. But he doesn't want Stacy 
to catch wind of this so he keeps it a secret from her by having some of the people closest to her in on the secret. He is having her follow to keep an eye on her and sends in the request to get Michael's body exhumed on September 5th of 2007. The medical examiner said that Michael's body was loaded with crystals and at this point Spinelli knew that Stacy had killed her husbands. He just had to prove it. The next day, Stacy's phones were wiretapped. Cameras were placed on her home and the graveyards at which um, her husbands were buried. She was brought in for questioning on September 7th, two days later. When Spinelli asked Stacy, do you remember which glass you poured the cranberry juice in? Stacy replied, I poured the Anna and cut herself off before finishing the word and then quickly said, I mean cranberry juice. I meant to say cranberry juice. You keep confusing me. Stacy decides she's done with the interview. I mean, because they are just, they're just trying to frame her. So four days later on September 12th, Ashley started her first day of college. And as exciting and nerve wracking as it can be, you know, introduced to a whole new world of the college life. Detectives showed up to let her know that her father had indeed died of antifreeze poisoning and not of a heart attack. You know, now she's filled with so many emotions. She calls her mom and remember the phone is wiretapped, okay? And questions about what was said was exchanged and Stacey tells her daughter, why don't we just have a drink together. We both had a hard day learning the news. So Ashley comes home and her mom makes her a drink. She starts to become lethargic and dizzy and goes to lay down in bed. That next morning, she wakes up hung over, but still makes it to class on time and is thankful when she gets back home to just lay down and just shake off this hangover, right? We've all been there. Her mom, eager to celebrate her 21st birthday, convinces her daughter to have another cocktail. Let's celebrate early. Besides, there's no better way to cure a hangover than with another drink, <laughs> right? So she took the drink uh, of the cocktail her mom made and it was nasty, but her mom, you know, she's got a few tricks up her sleeve and told her, here, drink it out of a straw. Just stick the straw closest to the back of your mouth, you know, near your throat. You won't taste it as much. It'll bypass all your taste buds on your tongue. So Ashley does. She was tired after that drink and just wanted to go lay down. So she did. That next morning, Bree went in to check on her and found her shallow breathing. So she hollered for her mom to call 911. There was a page long note that was apparently typed up by Ashley stating how she had taken her father's life and her stepfather and she just couldn't handle it anymore and wanted to take her own life. Stacy rung 911 and told them that her daughter tried to, you know, take her own life and that there was a note and she was drinking after taking medication. Now, when Ashley woke up in the hospital, she denied all claims of that. And, you know, killing her father and her stepfather. Why would she do that? Stacy was arrested there at the hospital for the murder of David and the attempted murder of her own daughter, Ashley. On December 20th of 2007, Stacy was indicted on two counts of second degree murder, one count of second degree attempted murder, and one count of um, presenting a forged will. Because remember, David's will left nothing to his own blood son, but everything to Stacy and her two girls. And on September 25th, 2008, the judge ruled that evidence from Michael's death, the first husband, 
could be used in the trial of David's death and Ashley's attempted death. So the trial began on January 12th of 2009. And Stacy's attorney was going into this trial with the whole idea that Ashley was behind all of this and um, was the one to poison David. Like that was their entire defense was basically Stacy framing her own daughter, the one who she claims to have been best friends with growing up. Now the jury had deliberated for four days. And when they came back, they found Stacy guilty for the murder of Michael and the attempted murder of her own daughter. They found two drafts on the computer of this, you know, this note that she claimed Ashley wrote. They had wiretapped her phone and had conversations that gave supportive evidence. And they also found it very strange how Ashley sat on the stand and looked her mom in the eyes saying, you tried to kill me. And there was no reaction from Stacy, none whatsoever. Who does that? Like who tries to first kill their kid? Secondly, when they confront you about it and it's like, they're just a stranger talking to you. Oh, mm. on March 5th, 2009, Stacy was sentenced to 51 years in prison. Ashley said she never knew what hate was until her mother did that to her. Stacy ended up dying in prison of natural causes in 2016 at the age of 48. Natural causes. Okay. But what do you guys think? To frame your own daughter, the one you claim is your best friend right like why not just take the money from the two men that you just so desperately want no you have to go and do the ultimate betrayal and frame your daughter because you couldn't successfully kill her that's just messed up and maybe that's why you know she died so young was because karma came back around I don't know, but you'll have to let me know what you guys think. And until next time, please remember to be safe and I will see you then. Bye.